Okay, so this is a week six lecture on the cell cycle control. So looking at the cell cycle control, uh, why is it needed? So when, uh, when the cells divide, organisms grow. Essentially, this is what, you know, this is what grows multicellular organisms. This is even how repair occurs. Now, um, so this is why it's needed, okay? You, to grow multicellular organisms and for repairs to occur. So just two points. What about, what's this next point talking about? So uh, in order for, again, for cells to grow and, and for repair to occur, proper DNA is needed, all right? So again, you need to regulate that DNA. And um, you know, you have to grow at a specific rate and it needs to grow at specific times. So again, this is that where that regulation comes into play. Now, in addition to that, we also need order, okay? So um, again, without regulation, we'll end up accumulating too many cells, and that's gonna be disorder. Uh, and when we have this disorder, then we end up having chaos that forms. So to give an example of that, when you don't have regulation, and you know there is not an order to specific uh, events from taking place. So in other words, again, if you, let me put it in a different way to you. If we were going to bake a cake, we need to start off, you know, we have a recipe and, you know, in order to, uh, to make that, you need to have, I don't know, maybe a cup of flour and then you need maybe uh, a cup of water that you mix first and after you mix those two things first, then you add in some butter to it, for example, and then you mix that butter. Uh, and then you add the sugar and then you you know you mix in the sugar so again you you're mixing s specific ingredients at specific points in time so and the quantities of these ingredients is also measured so again this is our regulation and when we add each one of those things that's the order when do we put in the when do we put in um, you know sugar when do we add in the butter uh, so again, these all happen at specific stages of the process. And you know, if this doesn't happen, if we don't do that, then what happens? You know, we can take all of our mixture and put it inside the oven, but will, will we get a cake? You know, no, it, it won't happen. It's not gonna go carry through because we didn't add in the, you know, maybe we put too much flour or too little water. Uh, or again, maybe we didn't mix the water and flour together at a specific time. Uh, then, you know, if we didn't have the, the regulation and we didn't have order, then we're not going to end up getting whatever product we're looking for. So same thing in cells. If, you know, during this uh, cell cycle, okay, the, the cell division process, if you're not dividing at specific times, if you're not uh, caring about specific steps at specific times, that's going to lead to disorder. And essentially, this is what cancer is. So again, when you're looking at cancer, this is too many cells that start to accumulate. Uh, and, you know, excessive cells, they end up um, building up into what we know as to be tumors. And these tumors, then they go and they create secondary sites where they start to congregate. And this is what metastasis is. So very simplistically, cancer is just uncontrolled cell division. Before we move on to the lecture, let's just review some of the terms from the previous lecture that we had. A lot of students confuse the terms centromere with centrosome and centrioles. So let's start off with centromere. When we look at this structure here, this is a chromosome. And a chromosome is made up of two sister chromatids. So what holds both of these together, the sister chromatids together, is a centromere. Now let's go to the terms centrioles and centrosomes. This and this, these orange structures, this is a centriole. These are each centrioles. In animal cells, when you have two centrioles, and we find them at the opposite poles of that cell, the term that we use to describe them is centrosome. So what you're going to find is that from each centriole, you have these little fibers that come out. And again, these fibers are called the spindle fibers, or you can also call them spindle microtubules. These spindle fibers will come, and then they will attach to the kinetochores on the centromere, and then they will help separate the sister chromatids to the opposite poles, as in mitosis. So once again, remember, centriole are the structures to which the, the spindle fibers are attached to. And in animal cells, when you have two of these centrioles, 
Again, and you can see them, they're at 90 degree angles of one another. We use the term centrosome to describe them. Okay, and remember, the centromere is what holds the sister chromatids together. Howard Pell in 1953 is the individual that's credited for first describing the cell cycle. And essentially, when you look at it, again, it's the cell cycle, it's defined as the stages through which the cell progresses through from one cell division cycle to the next. And it's during this phase the cell is going to grow and it prepares for, uh, for division. Now, what ends up happening as it goes through these alterations, there's this, you know, essentially what you're doing is you're doubling the genome, the DNA, in the synthesis phase or the S phase of interphase, and then you're taking that double genetic information and you're dividing it up. Okay, you're having that genome during the, the mitotic phase or the M phase. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, the cell cycle consists of two parts okay, or two phases. So the first phase, uh, the first one of those two phases is interphase. Okay? And then the second is going to be the M phase. So in interphase, what's happening is we're, so think of this as a preparatory phase. And this preparatory phase, it's going to lead to a doubling of the genome. In other words, it's going to be lead to twice the number of DNA or, again, twice the number of chromosomes. So it's made up of three subphases. There's a G1, or the gap one phase. There's the S phase, which is the synthesis phase. And then there's the G2, or gap two phase. Then we have the M phase. So remember, in the first part over here, what did we do? Essentially, we're just doubling that G, uh, the, the, the DNA. Now the second part, the M phase, the M phase, we're going to be dividing that. And this division ends up in two parts. Okay, so there's two subphases of that, uh, the, the M phase. So the first part is the uh, karyokinesis. And karyokinesis is just essentially, we're going to be dividing into the four phases. We, in other words, we have um, uh, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Then we have, after that, cytokinesis. And cytokinesis, essentially, this is just the division of the cytoplasm. Okay, so remember, the M phase, this is a phase of division, and it has two subphases. Uh, two subphases. And e the first subphase is karyokinesis, and the second subphase is the cytokinesis. And in karyokinesis, it has four additional subphases. We divide that into prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Now, once we have this, then we move on to cytokinesis, which, which is the division of the cytoplasm. OK, so let's look at what's happening in the cell cycle. So when you look at this slide over here in this previous slide, remember, we said that the cell cycle has two main phases, right? Interphase, and we said it had the M phase. So when you come over here, everything that you see over here in orange, all of this is interphase, OK? And then we have this very small part over here, M phase. And remember, M phase essentially is divided into we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So when you look at the big picture, this entire time, so this, this circle, if you look at it, just think of this as uh, the time it takes for these processes to occur. So interphase takes up the most amount of time. And then this tiny little part over here, where prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, this is the shortest amount of time it takes. So if you were to think about it, imagine all this takes place in perhaps 20 hours and only four hours for, for metaphase. Now, let's go back one more step. Let me clear this markings for a minute first. So we'll go over here. Well, maybe I cannot clear the markings for some reason because this is Microsoft and their products always don't function as we want. All right, so since that's not happening, Interphase gets divided into, if we go back over here, remember what we said. Interphase is also divided into different uh, sections or different parts. So 
And we said they are the G1, the synthesis phase, and the G2, or the gap two. So if you look over here again, the first part is the G1 phase. Okay, all this is G1. And the second part, and we're gonna talk about in this lecture, what, so in this lecture, we're just gonna be looking at interphase. So we're gonna talk about what G1 is, what happens over here. So in the second part is this S phase, or the synthesis phase. Then the last part is this G2 phase, or the gap two phase. So again, this takes up a lot of time. This also takes up uh, quite a bit of time. This tends to be a little bit shorter than compared to these two in terms of time. And then again, of course, you have this mitotic phase, which is the same. So this is what we're going to be looking at in today's lecture. Essentially, we're looking at all of interphase, what happens in G1, what happens in the S phase, what happens in the G2 phase. And also, we're going to be looking at what makes things go from G1 to S and what makes things go from the S to the G2, and how do things eventually you know, progress through the mitosis phase also, and what happens sometimes when cells don't grow. So that's this, this, uh, this uh, G, G sub-zero phase. Well, so we'll talk about all these today, and we'll look at the little some of the details that they go through. Okay, so let's talk about the events that are taking place in the G1 phase. So in G1, what's happening is that we're getting the synthesis of enzymes that are required for DNA replication. Okay, that's one. We're also getting synthesis of RNA that's needed for transcription and translation. Also, the synthesis of ATP. Remember, in order to make another cell, it requires a lot of energy. So now we need to make sure that we're going to have enough energy to power the rest of the process. So ATP is being produced. In addition, in addition to that, we're also synthesizing all the raw, raw, material that, the, the raw materials that we're going to be needing. So uh, pentose sugar, phosphoric acids, uh, the nitrogenases. All of this is getting ready so uh, DNA duplication in S phase can take place. Aside from that, so many other things are being synthesized. Uh, therefore, what ends up happening is the size of the cell also starts to increase. So now the cell is also getting bigger. Yeah, the, the area of the cell is, uh, is increasing. When all this is done, it's all ready, now the cell is ready to enter the next phase, which is S phase. So at this point over here, if, uh, if all these are, are in place, then the cell can enter. Let's put this down. The cell is going to be able to enter S phase. Okay, so if everything passes over here, and we're going to talk about how it's able to pass. So we end up having what's called these, and we'll have a checkpoint over here before we move on to the next phase. So there's a G1S checkpoint. So if everything is, if the, the, the cell has gotten big, if all these other things are taking place, then we're ready to move on to the next phase. So we have a, a, a cyclin CDK complex that, that, that comes into place and pushes it to the S phase. So uh, that's, yeah, so this is what happens in G1 phase. In the S phase, uh, remember, so essentially what's happening over here, S is for the synthesis phase. What are we synthesizing? We are synth synthesizing DNA. We're having DNA replication that's taking place. Uh, however, keep this in mind. So in addition to the DNA replication that's taking place, the cell, uh, the cell growth continues to occur throughout the, the S phase. And in addition to that, proteins and enzymes that are necessary for, for DNA synthesis, they also continue to be produced. Aside from that, the centrioles, they also divide. Now, this only happens in animal cells. Um, in addition to that, we also have the synthesis of, of histone proteins that are needed as well. And again, if everything is okay over here, then the cell is ready to enter into the next phase. Now the cell can go into G2 phase, if everything checks out over here, if everything, once we get past this part. All right, so now we're, we're in G2. So in G2 phase, what, what's happening? What are the events that are occurring? So first thing that we see over here is that we have the synthesis of uh, tubulin proteins. Okay? These are required for the spindle formations. The other thing that we have is the, the synthesis of proteins that are that, that are going to be needed for the plasma membrane to form. Okay, so. Uh, plasma membrane formation proteins are being synthesized, they're being produced. Also, we're gonna make two new cells, so guess what? We're gonna need twice the number of organelles. 
So the cell organelles are also doubled in during this phase, in G2 phase. Uh, in addition to that, lots of AT molecules are going to be required in order for, <clears throat> excuse me, in order for the uh, for the movement of these uh, chromosomes to occur. So just to kind of give you an example, uh, you need about 30 ATP molecules per chromosome for them to to move to the equator. So again, ATP in, uh, ATP synthesis also starts to uh, ends up being increased at this point. In the, in addition to that. RNA synthesis also takes place, right? So uh, these, uh, this is a, again, this is a very busy and very uh, energy intensive uh, phase of the, the cell cycle that's uh, in, in G2 that's taking place. So you can see that all the, the, the creation, the doubling of the material, it, this is all taking place in, uh, in the interface. So remember, just, let's just go back over here. This is where, where we're at over here. We went through here, we went through here, now we're finally over here. And the next stop is the mitotic phase. So during this time, you know, we ended up getting everything that, that, that we're going to be, that we're going to need in order to, to do what we need to do over here, which is again, produce DNA. Now that we produce DNA, we continue to, again, even during this time, we talked about the continuation of, of producing uh, proteins. Uh, and then when you come over here, again, we end up making uh, more histones, we make more RNA, uh, again, a lot more energy is needed. And again, remember, even in G1, we were producing a lot of uh, ATP just to power, you know, to allow for G1 to, to, to take place and also for, for the synthesis process. But it doesn't stop there. We, need, we still need a lot of energy to allow for this to take place. And then even for over here, okay, the things that are going to be happening over here, the energy gets produced to allow this cycle to complete. So this is uh, essentially what where we stop with the, the G2 phase. Okay, so now we are in M phase. And remember, we said that M phase consists of two subphases, right? First we said was the karyokinesis and the other was cytokinesis. And we said that karyokinesis, it has four subphases uh, that are involved. So uh, again, very quickly, remember, in prophase, what takes place is the chromatids, the recoiling, the nuclear, uh, the nuclear membrane starts to disintegrate, uh, as well as the, uh, the, uh, the nucleolus. In addition to that, we have the formation of the spindles. As we move on to metaphase, in metaphase, the chromosomes, they orient at the, uh, the equatorial plane. Then we go on to anaphase, and remember, in anaphase, we have the chromatids, start to get pulled, in other words, they're moving to the opposite poles. And in telophase, now that the chromatids are at the opposite poles, we start to have the uh, re reconstruction of the, uh, the daughter nuclei that starts to form, and then the cleavage stir starts to form at that point. Uh, so remember, at this point, the cell is gonna be elongated. Okay? It kinda looks like a football. And then we start to have this furrow that starts to come in from, from both ends, All right? And then, uh, in the last part, again, the second part to it, in cytokinesis, we're going to end up with two identical cells. So in cytokinesis, we get a formation of the cell plate, right? Uh, so again, this leads to uh, an equal division of the cytoplasm. We end up having uh, an, equal an equal amount of, uh, again, we have one nuclei per cell. The organelles are also divided, uh, the cell membrane. In other words, we have two identical daughter cells. Okay? So this essentially is the end result after we go through all these phases. All right, so we've made two daughter cells. What happens now? So post cell division, right? So after cell division, each of the daughter cells begins the interphase of a new cycle, right? Now, some of these cells, for example, you know, like your, your heart cell, kidney cells, um, cells of your liver and neurons, after remaining in G1 phase for some time, they come out of the cell cycle and they enter this G, the G0 phase, okay, or G sub zero phase. Um, this is also called the quiescent phase. Okay? Quiescent phase essentially it means it's in a dormant state, it's inactive. So it's Q, U, I, it's a, um, E, S, C, E, N, T. Okay. 
quiescent state. So now this quiescent phase. So in the quiescent phase, the cell division stops, but but other activities of the cells, it continues. So in other words, you have an active cell. It's just not going to be dividing. Um, sometimes the cell, it re-enters the cell cycle from the quiescent phase when it's required. All right, so the cell cycle, it doesn't occur in an unchecked manner. Right? So think of this as a quality control process. Uh, the cells, they're checked by regulatory molecules. They detect and they repair DNA damage as well as the prevention of uh, uncontrolled cell division. So they can either repair it or again, they, you know, if, if it's unrepairable, then they can take other steps to go end up stopping that cell from growing. And again, in some cases, um, you know, it, it'll direct the cell into apoptosis and that's, you know, the cell will die. Right? It's just program cell suicide, it's programmed cell death. So, you know, so there's two process processes that, that, that can take place. So one, the first, pro the first of these two process is that, uh, you know, there's going to be, so um, yeah, the first process is that there's going to be a signal for a growth. Okay, so you either, you either get a growth signal or you get a stop signal. So either you continue, you grow, and you keep moving along this this process, you know, going from one phase to the next phase to the next phase, or you stop, right? So you have two possibilities uh, th that'll happen. Uh, so, and again, these grow and stops, they happen at specific time points. And these time points are called checkpoints. Okay? And we have three major checkpoints, which, we, which we'll be looking at uh, in a minute, in, in the next slide. We'll kind of go, go over this one more time. Um, so remember, grow signal, we have a signal for grow, and we have a signal for stop. Now, what makes these signals either, you know, to grow or to continue, or to stop, go or stop, what ends up happening? So we have regulatory molecules. We have two classes of these regulatory molecules that determine uh, a cell's proper progress through the cycle. So the first one of them is, or are, cyclins, and the other are, cyclin dependent kinases. So again, when you look at this name over here, cyclin dependent kinases, so these are kinases, these are enzymes that are dependent upon cyclins. Okay, so they can't function by themselves. They need the cyclins in order to, to be able to do their job. And essentially what they do is they, they go about phosphorylating other, pro they activate other proteins. That's what they end up doing. When you end up you know, getting a, a complex that forms and you know, in, in their active form, this is what they'll do. They'll push things through to start other processes. They, they will make other proteins work. So uh, yes, so remember, cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases, kinases um, and we, just, we can call them CDKs for short, they work together. And usually we have a lot of these cyclins in the cell. There's going to be lots of them. The limiting factor usually tends to be the CDKs. Okay, so again, remember, why are we doing this? We're doing this to make sure that, well, you know, we don't want uncontrolled, we want regulation. Okay, remember what, what we said earlier on when we started the lecture. Things need to happen at specific points in time, and things need to happen in, in certain orders. And again, we need to check to make sure that everything's okay. And this is what the, 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 the purpose of this is. Okay, so again, this is, these are just checks and balances, quality control measures. We want to make sure that everything is okay before we move on to the next phase. And once everything gets done at one phase and we're ready to move on to another phase, we want to make sure that everything has been done properly. So, uh, you know, if you, again, try to think about the analogy that I gave earlier on about baking a cake. Uh, so again, once everything is okay, then we can start doing the next, next process, the next steps. Okay, so before we move through Keep in mind what I said in the, in the previous slide. So remember, when we're looking at checkpoints, checkpoints, these are quality assurance points. Um, so these quality assurance points, they occur at, uh, at specific time spots in this cycle, okay, in the cell cycle. So for example, there's one time spot, there's three main ones that happen, okay? So there's one that occurs right over, about over here, okay? So this happens this is the checkpoint one, the first checkpoint. 
Uh, this happens between G1 and the S, uh, the, the S phase. Now, uh, another one that occurs will happen between the S and, and the G2. And again, you know, they're doing research on this. So sometimes, you know, you see maybe it happens over here, then it can also happen over here at the end of G2 as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have, let's just go over here. You have the you know, checkpoint over here, checkpoint two. And then you have a third checkpoint. Remember what we have over here. You have all the different phases. You've got uh, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and we have telophase over here, right? So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. I'm not able to use this uh, pen properly because I don't have that much control over this with the, with the trackpad. So, well, so prophase, metaphase, anaphase. So between prof um, metaphase and anaphase, we have, so here, metaphase over here, and we have anaphase over here. Let me put this on A for anaphase. So we're going to have another checkpoint right over here. Okay. So again, you've got one checkpoint over here. you got second checkpoint over here, checkpoint number two, checkpoint one checkpoint two and this is our third checkpoint over here let's just put it that way like that one two three all right so again as i said these are specific points time spots within the cycle so um all right at this first checkpoint checkpoint one the one that happens between the g1 and the s phase uh one of the things that what gets checked at this checkpoint okay so at this this time spot right over here at this time spot uh, the cytoplasm to nucleus ratio is going to be checked. We want to make sure that all the enzymes that we're going to be needing for what's going to ha be happening over here, which is DNA replication. We want to make sure that we have all these enzymes. So if all these things and, you know, lots of other things also take place, if all these things are, are okay, they're ready, then we end up getting a go signal. Okay? And that go signal is going to push us through to the next phase, this S phase. And then again, at this point over here, at the second checkpoint, at checkpoint two, what's happening over here? We're looking at DNA replication. Okay, so it can either happen over here or over there. Uh, the DNA replication, did proper replication take place? Uh, is there pro are there proper RNA, in, in other words, the proper RNA DNA, uh, DNA synthesis uh, that, that's occurred? So this is the, like the, the big thing, the main thing that's going to be looked at over here. Okay, then we get to checkpoint uh, checkpoint uh, three. So again, checkpoint three is going to be happening between uh, metaphase and anaphase. So at this point, again, we're checking for uh, proper alignment of the chromosomes uh, and, and the chromatids, and we want to make sure that the microtubule to the cuticular assembly uh, is proper. Because remember, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be pulling apart the sister chromatids over here. So if um, you know, microtubules are not assembled, they're not connected properly to the cuneal core, then we can't divide. You can't move the sister chromatids to the opposite poles. So this is one of the things that's being checked over here. These are a couple of the things that, that are being looked at over here. So again, and if that is proper and it's in place, then again, we'll get a go signal to, to move forward, okay? So we can progress. So each one of these checkpoints, they're making sure that everything has been properly done. And if it has been properly done, we end up getting a go signal and again, same thing over here, everything is done properly over here, over there. We get a go signal to go to the next point. And if everything is okay over here, we get another go signal to go to the next point. So all of these uh, are, are taking place. So we have these three major checkpoints in the, in the cycle. Now sometimes you see over here this G sub, um, sub zero. Um, th th this uh, phase over here, the cell can sometimes go over here. Remember what I said before. If for whatever reason, like a heart cell or a kidney cell, remember they don't divide. So once they're produced, and you know they stay in this dormitory or some some other type of cells as well, they end up staying in this dormitory uh, phase where you know they're not going to be dividing or anything. But again, the cell is metabolically active; it's doing what it needs to do. That heart cell is going to be continuing to uh, to work to do all, all it does, which is contract, uh, so the blood can be pumped uh, between the chambers. That's going to continue to happen. The only thing is that cell is not going to divide. 
it, it won't reproduce. It won't pr uh, reproduce itself. So that's where it stays at, at this point. Now again, sometimes, again, uh, so I gave the example of heart cells and neurons. That's it. You know, once you're over here, they're not going to get back into this G1 phase. So other type of cells, sometimes they do go into this, uh, uh, this phase, this resting phase, uh, or this timeout phase, if you want to think about it. And then, you know, certain events lead, certain events cause them to enter back into G1 phase, and then where they will end up continuing uh, the cycle. So that is also uh, a possibility. So remember, this is G0, this is a, a hold phase. Another, another thing that can happen is, you know, sometimes maybe it needs to get repaired. There's something wrong over here. So uh, once the repair takes place, everything's in the fix, then it could get pushed into back into the G1 and then it'll go into the S phase. So essentially this, these are the things that, that occur at these checkpoints. All right, now let's go back and start talking about these regulatory molecules. Now remember, we said we had two main classes of these regulatory molecules. We had the, the cyclines and we had the cyclin-dependent kinases. Um, now, one other thing to, you know, that I wanted to remind you is cyclines, they're, they're specific to uh, the sp specific, um, these cell cycles, okay? So you might have uh, one type of cycline that you see over here, but you'll never see over here or here or there. So again, they're very specific as to where you find them, which phase you find these cyclines in. Okay, so keep that in mind moving forward. So again, these cyclines are specific to uh, stages. Now, so the levels of these cyclines, they rise and fall as the stage of, of the cycles go through. So these, uh, the, the cyclin-dependent the, the cyclin kinases, their levels in the cells, they tend to remain stable. CDKs also, they, they bind to their appropriate cyclin, but they remain inactive, okay? So again, this is another property. They remain active, they bind to their appropriate cyclin. Remember, CDKs are specific to work with cyclins. So they only work with one specific cyclin. And um, again, until they become, there, there has to be a process in, in, uh, in which they end up becoming activated, and again, they functionally, their job is to provide phosphate groups to a number of different proteins that control the processes in the cell. So essentially, this is their job. They end up going phosphorylating other proteins. Uh, this is how cyclins and CDKs end up uh, working with one another. So if you look over here, for example, in, uh, in G1, the main cyclin that works is the, the D cyclin. <clears throat> and again, the in G1, the main cyclin dependent kinases or this, um, the main cyclin dependent kinase is cdk4 also cdk6 is there and there's other ones but let's just we'll keep it simple for now um in s phase okay the cyclin we find cyclin e and a and the cdk we end up finding in s phase is cdk2 and in the m phase the cyclin that we find is our uh, cyclin B. Okay, so, and what's the CDK we find? We have CDK1 in M phase. When we look at the slide over here, so this is telling us that in G1, we have cyclin D and the cyclin dependent kinase is CDK4. And what's the cyclin CDK complex that forms? You have a G1 cyclin and uh, cyclin D, a CDK complex, a complex that forms. And then over here, you see the function. It inhibits some of these proteins, uh, these RB proteins, retinoblastoma proteins, and these they, these retinoblastoma proteins, they end up signaling the cell to start preparing for replication. And then you go on to the S phase. We have cyclin E and cyclin A, and what's the CDK? It's CDK2. So again, you end up getting this um, cyclin E, CDK2 complex that forms a cyclin A, CDK2, and this activates DNA replication. When you go to the G2 phase, again, we have cyclin B over here and we have CDK1. And we end up having a, a cyclin B, CDK1 complex that forms. And this essentially activates or pushes the process of mitosis through. So remember what I said earlier. Cyclins, you know, we have a lot of CDKs, but we don't have too much cyclins. So if you look over here, uh, as you look at the concentration of cyclins versus the phases at the time points, 
So you'll see that, uh, you know, in G, initially in G1 phase, we don't have too much uh, cyclin D, but as you progress through, the amount starts to go up, it rises. And then, you know, it tends to remain pretty much stable throughout the, the S and the uh, G2 phase, and then it starts to decline afterwards. However, take a look at cyclin E. Notice that cyclin E, it goes up and it's, it peaks at right at the end of the G1 phase, and it goes on for a little bit of the S phase, and then it starts to decline, it, it, uh, it comes down, it declines right away, and then, you know, it's, it's gone, we don't see it anymore. Same thing with cyclin A. Cyclin, cyclin A levels slowly, much, much slower, they start to rise uh, towards the late part of G1 phase, and again, towards the end of the S phase, they approach their peak, and then as we enter mitosis, they start to decrease. As for cyclin B, okay, cyclin B ends up being produced or uh, at the start of, looks like almost at the start of S phase. And its numbers, they start to increase slowly throughout the S phase. And again, they take a real sharp uh, increase over here. The steep changes quite a bit significantly in the G2 phase. So at this point, by the time you get to the my my mitosis, you end up having a peak amount of cyclin B. And then again, shortly afterwards, it declines. So nearly everything, we end up having a peak, and then, you know, they start to decline afterwards, uh, after a certain point. So again, you find them at specific points. And again, usually where they tend to be, uh, they peak at, this is the point where they're going to be utilized the most. So again, cyclin B, we need it, and it only works during mitosis. Cyclin A, well, we need it at this point in uh, G2. Cyclin E, it ends up being used in uh, at the, the S phase. So again, let's just kind of go over this. I've showed it to you before, but again, um, let's go over this in this slide. So these cell cycle checkpoints are used by the cell to monitor and regulate the progress of the cell cycle as it progresses through the different steps. The cells are not able to proceed to the next phase until the checkpoint requirements have been met. Now, as I showed you earlier before, the three main check checkpoints that we have, the first one happens at the G1S, between the G1 and S phase, and so we call this the G1S checkpoint. So this is before the cell enters the S phase. Next, we have the G2, the G2M checkpoint, and this happens after S phase. Okay, last, we have the APCC checkpoint, and uh, that's, by the way, it stands for anaphase promoting complex, okay? Anaphase, anaphase promoting complex cyclosome. So anaphase promoting complex cyclosome. So uh, the APCC checkpoint, so this is going to be happening during mitosis. Okay, so these are the three main checkpoints that we have. And again, remember, they're used to monitor and regulate the progress of the cell. At this first checkpoint, okay, checkpoint one, this G1S checkpoint. Remember, this is before the cell enters S phase. We're checking for cell size, right? Did it grow? Now, imagine this. If the cell size does not get big and we produce everything and we double the DNA, but we've got, and we end up doubling the DNA, or we're not, we're not even at that point yet to double the DNA, but we just end up uh, producing everything that we're going to need, but the cell doesn't get big. And what difference does, does, does it make? We cannot enter cytokinesis now, can we? It wouldn't be possible because this, the cell is too small, right? We don't have enough material to end up forming a new plasma membrane. There's not going to be enough room for the organelles. So we have to make sure that the cell has grown in size as well. So this is the one, one of the main things. Again, do we have enough nutrients that we're going to need for the other two stages to go through? Okay. Next thing we're going to be looking for, is there any damage to the DNA? So it's checking for all the preparation, so uh, other preparations also. We're looking at, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we're looking at um, proteins. Do we have enough proteins in, uh, in ATP? 
energy that we're going to need for remember the cell replication process requires a lot of energy so if we have all this okay we have all the proteins we have all the ATP that's what it's going to be looking at as well um, yeah it's also going to check whether for cycling checks it's going to check for whether uh, the S phase cyclins and the C CDK complex uh, is a uh, has been paired Okay, is it activated? Is it ready to initiate the DNA replication? So once all this is has taken place, then the cell is able to pass on and move into the into the next phase. Okay, now we're at uh, the the G2M checkpoint. So remember, this happens after S phase. So what's going on over here? Well, what did we do in S phase? We synthesized more genetic information. We synthesized DNA. So it's checking for proper DNA replication. So in addition to that, it's going to make sure that all the preparations uh, that are required for M phase are, are, are met. So it's going to be looking at all the proteins, if there's enough ATP, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure that all of that is there to go on to the next part. Um, also, it's going to be looking for tubulin, as tubulin, uh, tubulin been synthesized. In addition to that, it's going to check to see whether the M phase cyclins and the CDA complexes, if they've been activated, not activated, but if they've been paired, uh, if they're present uh, or, or not. So it's gonna be checking for that as well. So if all these things, everything is okay, then we're gonna get a go signal. So remember, this is a checkpoint. So if everything is okay over here, then we get a, a, a signal to move into the next part, which is the, the M phase. Then we arrive over here at the APCC checkpoint. So what's going on over here? Well, very simplistically, we're looking for proper alignment and mark a tubule assembly to the commuter core. So if everything is okay over here, then we're good to go. We're, we're, we're uh, good to proceed on through the, the, remainder, the remaining pro uh, process of mitosis. So um, once that's done, then you know there's a couple of options. The cell will either go back into the cell cycle, or again, remember, you can go and just stay in that geo phase where it, it, uh, it remains inactive. So remember, cyclins, they're a type of protein that control the, pro uh, the, the progression of the cell to go through the cell cycle. And they're not able to move through the subsequent stage uh, of the cell cycle unless the, that specific cyclin ends up meeting its threshold. So cyclins, they work with other enzymes, they work with other proteins called cyclin-dependent kinases, okay? So cyclins work with enzymes, C, uh, the CDK enzymes, all right? Without them, they're not able to function. Uh, the kinase, so once you end up getting uh, a cyclin and a CDK complex that forms, the kinase becomes uh, active, and then essentially what it does is this activated uh, CDK, it ends up going and phosphorylating other proteins. And then that other protein is able, able to go and, and push other things through, other processes through. Okay, so this is essentially what ends up happening with uh, cyclins and CDKs and how the cell cycle progresses through, how it pushes through. So the activation process of cyclin and CDK is not easy. It's a, it's a rather complex process, but we're gonna, I'm going to try and simplify it for you to go through it by giving you an example of what happens. So remember, what's happening is this. Remember, overall, considering everything, everything that we've learned so far, as a cell progresses from one stage, for example, from G1 to S, there's going to be a checkpoint. And then again, from S to G2, there's going to be another checkpoint. And then we have another checkpoint between in the, the M phase. Let's look at this one over here. So if we go over here, remember, in metaphase, we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So in the mitotic phase, we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And remember, we have another checkpoint right over here. So over here, the, the checkpoint that happens over here, we end up having um, a, a cyclin CDK, CDK complex that forms, and this is the, it's called the, the maturation promoting factor cyclin CDK complex. So this is the M P 
MPF, okay, MPF, and that stands for maturation, I-O-N, promoting factor, okay, so cycling Okay, so the maturation promoting factor cycling CDK complex. This is what, what ends up happening here. So in order for this to, to occur, in order for the cycle to go from, from this phase and then on into the next, again, for the cycle to reoccur, what needs to happen is that, first of all, you end up having cycling and CDK that need to come in pair. So remember, over here, if you guys remember to... If you go back a handful of slides, let me switch this out into a different color. Let's go with um, let's go with blue. So we have a complex that forms, okay, and this is going to be our cyclin-dependent kinase, and so this is CDK, CDK1, okay, and then the cyclin that have, that we find over here is called cyclin B. So let's give it a different color. There we go. Actually, here, let me kind of, oops. Show you how this works. All right. So let's take this out and we'll go back over here now. And then we have a, a cycling over here. Remember, the cycling over here is cycling. Let me change this so you can see a little bit better. And let's just here, cycling B, cycling B. Okay, so cycling B is over here, and we have CDK one. These two need to come together, right? So they need to form. Uh, they need to be paired. So as time progresses, now the other thing I want to keep you in mind is this: this, all of this. Remember, inside the cell. There's a lot of cycling. A lot of cycling is going to be there. It's 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 always present. The limiting factor is going to be the 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 cycling um, cycling dependent kinase. So as this G1 phase, as synthesis, as G2 is taking taking place, during during this time over here, CDK and cycling uh, CDK1 and cycling B, they're coming and they're pairing they're pairing up. In other words, they're getting ready for what's going to take place by the time we get to this third checkpoint, all right? So all these pairings are already taking place. Because remember, this takes a long time. In G1, it takes a long time. S phase takes a long time, many, many hours. We're talking about maybe 10 hours over here, and then perhaps another nine hours over here, and maybe another, I don't know, six or seven or eight hours over here. So a lot of time is going by. So um, if we ended up waiting, by the time you got to this point over here, to this third checkpoint, and then we started binding, then that's going to end up taking more time as well. And so we don't want to, the, but the cell doesn't want to waste that time. So while all this is going on, these uh, cycling B and CDK1, they already come together in pairing. Okay. So remember, it's a checkpoint. So what's going to happen at this checkpoint is that it's, it's, it wants to make sure that everything is uh, set up properly. So in other words, uh, if all the, the chromosomes are properly aligned uh, in metaphase to, to go into, you know, to get into anaphase, if the uh, the the microtubules, if they're properly the the the, mic the mitotic spindles, if they're properly connected to the the kinetochores, if all of these things they pass, if everything is okay. If if the DNA is fine, the chromosomes are okay. If everything is in check, then you know we can progress to the next point. Then you know we're gonna get uh, essentially a signal that'll say, okay, everything is good. Let's move on. Okay. So what's gonna happen? Now let's go back down over here. So remember, while all this is going on, these guys, the cyclin B and CDK, they're coming and they're pairing already. Okay, so now let's go to the second part. So let's make this picture over here again. We'll go back over here and we've got this. 
times. Okay, now these two have paired. All right, you can see that over here. We've got this pairing that's that took place. So the first step, we had cyclin B and CDK1. Then they come and they pair. Now what's going to happen next is, okay, the second part, these two are paired. However, however, it's not active. So these are paired, but it's inactive. Okay, they're not ready to do anything yet. It's, it, they're incapable. Why? Because what ends up happening is this. At this point, there's two enzymes that come over here, two enzymes that, that come into play, play. These are kinase enzymes, and they end up phosphorylating uh, CDK. Okay? So they'll come and phosphorylate the, this guy over here, CDK1. They end up phosphorylating, uh, phosphorylating that. So let's draw another photograph or picture over here. Let's move along. So here we go. All right, and what do we have over here? This is our cyclin dependent kinase one. And then we have the our cyclin over here. Remember, these are they're paired. And this is cyclin B. Okay. Now Remember, this CDK1, this is what? This is, these are made up of amino acids, right? So on each, so there's an amino acid over here, and there's, well, here. there's going to be an amino acid over here, and there's going to be another amino acid over here. So two of these enzymes, they come and they phosphorylate. One's going to phosphorylate over here at this point, and the enzyme that comes and phosphorylates over here is called... Okay, this is going to be called the the Wee enzyme. Okay, Wee one enzyme. So Wee one comes and it phosphorylates this amino acid. All right. Now Wee one. This is a inhibitory enzyme. All right. So then on the other end, down over here, we have another enzyme that comes in over here. Now the enzyme that comes over here is called the CAC enzyme. Okay, so this is the so this is also going to phosphorylate. So this is a called the CAC enzyme. Now CAC enzyme, this is a activatory enzyme. All right. So CAC is the end at the activatory enzyme, and then um, so this is the activatory enzyme, and then we have the we one enzyme, which is inhibitory. So what, what's going on now? Now we have one enzyme that's trying to activate something, and the other, and this one's, well, here. We have this enzyme, which is trying to activate, and then we've got this one, which is inhibiting. So we're stuck. We can move forward. One is trying to move something forward, the other is pushing it back. So at this point, this is still inactive. This enzyme, it's still uh, the, the cyclin B and, the, and the, the CDK1, this complex that form, is still inactive. Okay, so let's put it down. Still inactive. Okay, so we're still inactive right at this point. Now, remember, we are over here at this point. We're in the, the mitotic phase. So, at this point, what ends up happening is this. If everything is in order, by the time the cell progresses through, by the time the cell progresses through over here, it goes through the G2, it comes over here, and the chromosomes are properly aligned. If there's proper, uh, the, the, the um, if we have proper connected, the, the microtubules are properly connected to the kinetochores. If everything else is perfect, everything is okay, there's no problem, and this, the, this, uh, the cell is ready to, to divide, the DNA is good, everything is perfect, then what's going to end up happening is that we end up getting another enzyme, all right? And this is called the, so if everything is perfect at this point, all the products are there, and the cell is ready to get divided, then a third enzyme comes into play. And this one, let's 
choose this. Okay. Number three, and this was, as I say, step two. This is step one. We'll come back and refer to these things in a minute. So next what's going to happen is this, at this third point, let me draw the, the photographs, the pictures first, uh, and then we can kind of go through it. So here we go again. Let's go with our, our CDK1. And we have our cycling up over here. Okay, this is our cyclin, cyclin B. All right, remember, these are paired. So remember, when we're looking over here at this point, remember what happened? Let's go over, remember, we have phosphorylation over here. This is inhibitory. Then we had the other one over here. This is act uh, the activatory, and what did we say? It's complex form, but it's stuck. It's not able to do, do anything because we have this activator and inactivator. So what do we need to do in order to make this work? We need to get rid of this inhibitory. We need to get rid of V1. So we need to cleave this. So what ends up happening is this. As I said earlier, if everything is okay over here. Right? All the checks are in place. The chromosomes being aligned. The microtubules properly connect to the kinetic cores. Uh, the, the DNA is good. Then this enzyme called, let me move back over here, change this out, let's just go to black for a minute. The name of the enzyme is, okay, it's CDC25. Phosphate. Okay, CD5, CDC25 phosphatase enzyme okay so cdc5 uh, cdc25 phosphatase enzyme it's going to come over here now let's go back here remember what we had okay so what it's going to do is this this enzyme will come and it will go over here to this v1 protein and it's going to end up cleaving that it's going to end up removing it so now once this enzyme is gone, it's removed, what do we have left with? We have, all we have left is this CAC enzyme down over here. Okay, and remember, this is the activatory enzyme. So now we have an active CDK1 and um, cyclin B complex. In other words, NPF now is functional. And at this point, this can move forward. So this activated enzyme, this activated complex, will then go and activate other proteins, okay, which is going to take the cell through its, the rest of the, the, the cell division process. It'll take it through. It'll drive it through the rest of the way down over here. So this is essentially what ends up happening. So let's kind of go over this one more time. So again, what's going to end up happening? We have the, let me use this marker and let me just take here, use purple and kind of go with a smaller one at this point. There. So we have CDK1 and we have cyclin B. These two will come together and they pair, okay? which is what we're looking at over here at this point. They're paired, however, they're still inactive. So what ends up happening now at this point is we get two kinase enzymes. One is the V1 and one is the CAC enzyme. So both V1 and CAC, they come and they phosphorylate CDK1, okay? So now that CDK1 is phosphorylated, the next thing, remember it's still inactive at this point. So the next thing is that, you know, it's gonna go through and check to make sure that everything is moving about properly over here at this point. If all the chromosomes are properly aligned, everything else is okay. And if everything else is okay, there will be a production of CDC25, okay? So if everything is okay, we have CDC25 present. So 
CDC 25 then will come and end up removing this we one enzyme. And when we one is once we one is removed, it's dephosphorylated, then at that point we have this complex which is activated. So MPF at this point, so remember, what do we have? MPF is going to go and activate other proteins. Right? So this is what ends up happening. This is how these uh, cyclin and CDK complexes they end up working uh, overall. All right, so, so far we talked about uh, checkpoints and you know we said that if everything's okay then the cell continues so you know, and then you know we talked about the cyclin and uh, cyclin uh, cyclin activated kinases forming complexes to continue the process to to move forward uh, in, in the subsequent steps now the other thing is is what if you do not get that meaning what if the, the, the you know something is wrong then what happens well, at that point, we have some options. So, remember, if we have, we have two options, right? And our two options are going to be that we have either, so here, we have a checkpoint. And in this checkpoint, we have either a positive signal or we have a, a negative signal. Okay? All right, so it could be, the checkpoint could be either positive or negative. Now, what happens if we have a positive signal, then what, it's, the, it's easy, right? If we have a positive signal, we know that we're going to end up getting cell division that's going to take place. Cell division takes place, and that happens. We end up getting the cyclin and the CDKs okay, forming complexes and then they, they progress the, the stages through. Now, what if the signal is negative? And we'll talk about what it means to get to, to have a negative signal. So if the signal is negative, in that case, we get a, we didn't get a cell division signal, but we get a signal for you have a stop signal. So this is what happens. You get a stop signal. And when we get that stop signal, now we have a protein that comes into play. So that could be, for example, that could be, uh, oh, P53, P53, or it could be one like P22. Okay, so these are proteins that essentially that will do a couple of one of two things. Okay, they will either repair or fix whatever is wrong, or the other option is that they end up killing the cell. Okay, so these are the two options that could result. All right, so you look over here again. Just to go over, at these checkpoints that we have, checkpoints, two things can happen. Either we get a positive signal, and positive signal, everything is okay. Then we move through, we progress to the next point. So again, let's just say we're at the G1, and uh, we have all the, 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 the proteins and the enzymes that we're going to need, and the cell's grown in size, it's gotten big, uh, the, the, cell, uh, the cell size has increased, the ratio is okay. Then, in other words, we have a positive signal, and cyclins and CDKs, they're going to end up um, pushing the process into the S phase. All right, now what if that didn't happen? What if that was not the case? What if the cell was too small, didn't grow, or something was missing? Then, at that point, there's a negative signal. Okay? So that negative signal essentially is going to be a stop. Like, don't go to the next part. Why would you want to go to the next part if there's a problem? Because whatever problem that is, that's going to end up being replicated uh, if it's a replication problem or it may not even allow for that cell to divide properly. So you stop it. And now at that point, there's two possibilities. 
So again, how, what stops it? Again, this P53 protein, or it could be P22, or there's another one. Maybe it's a, anyways. Um, we end up getting this P53 protein. Let's just stay with this. It's gonna end up doing one of two things, okay? P53 essentially will either uh, repair or fix, okay? It's either gonna repair or fix, or, we should not have this. It's either gonna repair or fix, or it's gonna kill that cell, okay? And that's called apoptosis. Okay. So one of these two things will happen. Either the cell dies or the cell gets repaired. Now, how, what are, let's continue with this. What are these neg negative signals? So what are negative signals? In other words, where do we get them from? How do we get these negative signals? So for example, you can get a negative signal. So let's just do this negative signal. Can come from if there's damaged DNA, okay, so the DNA is damaged. That's gonna cause um, P53 to become, well, the P53 gene to become activated to produce a P53 protein. So that could be one of the things. Or, for example, it could be a mutation. Okay. Mutation can also induce P53. Or it could be, maybe it's a, there's a mistaken replication. Okay, so a mistaken replication. All these things has the ability to cause a stop signal, okay, from forming. So, what are negative signals? Negative signals, they are some mistake that could have happened, okay? So, a mistake in replication, or it could be DNA that's damaged, or again, it could be some type of mutation. Something is not right. Something that should be right is not right, okay? And this is what are negative signals. And when you end up having these negative signals, then what they do is that they end up going and they will, they end up causing P53 to become active. Okay, P53 becomes active. Okay? Now, um, what will happen over here? What happens at this point? So let's kind of look at, uh, let's look at an example. So for example, uh, let's say we have, let's say we have some, uh, some DNA over here, okay? And let's see, this DNA gets damaged. Okay, so again, we got this damage region over here. Let me just take a highlighter and, for example, oh, imagine this is a damage over here. This part is damaged, something happened. And how did this damage occur? Maybe, for example, um, summer, this is very common actually. What ends up happening? Sunlight, okay, so ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet radiation is gonna damage DNA. Now we got some bad DNA. DNA has been damaged. So what happens? Well, over here, some sensory proteins. Let's continue writing. So sensory proteins. We have sensory proteins, and these sensory proteins, they guess what they do. They sense damage. Now, two of these sensory proteins are CHK and ATM. Okay, so we have CHK and ATM. Right, these are sensory proteins, and again, when what they do is they 
are able to recognize, again, sensory, they can sense damage of, in this case, we're talking about DNA. Now, so, by the way, so this CHK, just so you know, this is, um, it's a checkpoint. Checkpoint kinase protein. Okay, so that's what that is. Now, um, so yeah, they, they are able to detect damaged DNA and then they end up going and they, okay, so these guys, they sense damaged DNA and then they, and then they phosphorylate Phosphorylate P53. Okay, so this is what they do. Um, CHK and ATM, they are able to phosphorylate P53. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So essentially, what ends up happening is well, let me show you. L again, let me draw this out for you uh, to, to make you understand what's going to happen. Now, this DNA gets damaged and CHK. Is able to sense it right so when CHK senses that damage they end up phosphorylating p53 okay now next we have let me show you we will have let's make a protein over here oops We got this protein over here, and then we got another protein over here like that. Now this is this is an MDM2. Okay, this is MDM2, and this is your P53. So you have complex. Now normally in cells we have lots and lots and lots and lots of these P53. They're they're present. They're there. But again, they're bound to MDM2, and MDM2 ends up inactivating the p53 okay so this is this is an inhibitor okay mdm2 this is an inhibitor okay so this complex as as it is is inactive okay so what ends up happening is when CHK senses that damage. CHK, when this damage occurs, CHK goes and it will phosphorylate. CHK will come and the CHK, it comes and phosphorylates P53 and it will phosphorylate NBM2. So what ends up happening is this. This is what happens now. When they get phosphorylated, now we've got let me move this over. P53. And then we got MDM2. They're deactivated now. Okay? They're not phosphorylated anymore. So here, this is our P53. Here's our MDM2. And Phosphorylated, phosphorylated. So they're both phosphorylated now. So now we have inactive. Once MDM2 gets phosphorylated, it becomes inactivated. So CHK, okay, essentially it's gonna break apart, it's gonna break apart this binding with P53 and MDM2. Again, and then it, it will uh, by phosphorylating it. So now this once this has been deactivated and P53 has also been phosphorylated, now P53 is active. Now it can go and go about doing its job. Now it can, uh, again, it will do a couple of things, okay? That, so there's two pathways that P53 can go to. Now one of the things is that once you phosphorylate P53, P53 has something that's known as auto it's an autoinducer. Let me go back over here. So P53 
53 will auto induce. So what does that mean? Essentially, it's going to produce more copies of itself. It's going to increase itself uh, in number, and it will go higher and higher. So there's the more P53 uh, that gets produced, and if there is damage, then more P53 ends up uh, being uh, transcripted and translated uh, until, you know, again, so what's going to happen? P53 has a couple of options. Remember what we said before. It can do two things, right? It can either repair or it can either repair or it can kill. So let's continue over here. So yes, once the high, if P53 concentration um, is high, so let's write that down over here. If you have high P53 concentrations, what's that gonna do is that it will recruit, it's gonna recruit a couple more proteins. It's gonna recruit P21 and maybe, for example, it could be P27. Okay. And these proteins, essentially, they start, they go about, starting about uh, apopto uh, apoptosis. Okay, remember, apoptosis, this is programmed cell death. And again, this can happen through one of two ways. It could be either through an intrinsic or the uh, extrinsic pathway. You don't have to worry about that now. So one of these two, two pathways uh, ends up killing the cell. Because remember, if these levels, again, like I said, if these levels go up way, they go up very high, then these two proteins start to, to uh, get recruited, and then they go about, essentially, killing the cell. So the other thing that P50, P53 can do is that it can try and repair. Okay? That's the other thing that uh, it could happen. So it's going to try to repair or fix whatever the issue may be. So if it's able to, to, to do that, then great. Once the repair has been done, then the cell can produce. Uh, then at that point, the signal may change from a negative signal into a positive signal. Okay, so that's the other possibility, possibility that could happen. Um, so let's see. We spoken about the different signal types. Let me make sure I didn't forget anything. Um, all right, yeah, so let's just kind of go over this very quickly. And we'll try to use a different highlighter so we can kind of understand what's going on. All right, so we talked about checkpoint signals. All right, and in checkpoint signals, once again, we said that the signals can be either positive or they could be negative, right? So positive or neg negative signals. If the signal is positive, the cell cycle uh, continues into cell division. And again, that occurs with the use of cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. If it's a negative signal, and we talked about what the negative sig signal could be, that neg negative signal could be damaged DNA, or it could be some type of a mutation, or perhaps it's some type of a mistake in replication. If that's the case, then a stop signal occurs. And that stop signal essentially is with this P53 protein, or perhaps P22, which will do either one of two things. They will either repair, or they will kill the cell. So if they repair the cell, if uh, you know if that's a possibility, and uh, the cell ends up getting repaired, then that's great. This will continue, hopefully, back into this positive, uh, um, positive state, and division will continue. However, if that does not happen, then at that point, then the cell ends up, what ends up happening is more and more P53 ends up getting produced, as we talked about over here, higher P53 concentrations result, which end up recruiting P21 or perhaps P27, and that takes it the cell into this apoptosis, either through an extrinsic or an intrinsic pathway, and then the cell ends up being killed. Now, um, we also said that um, in order for P53 to, to properly work, we first needed that negative signal, and so that we use this example of DNA being damaged. So if the DNA becomes damaged, for example, through ultraviolet radiation, 
Then we said that um, this CHK, checkpoint kinase protein, ends up coming into play. And what it does is it goes and phosphorylates the complex, the P53 and MDM2 complex that is formed. It will break it up by phosphorylating it. Therefore, by inhibiting MDM2, well, MDM2 is the inhibitor, so it will uh, phosphorylate the MDM2, rendering it inactive, and at that point, the P53 becomes active. Okay, so CHK essentially will go and break up this complex by phosphorylating both P53 as well as MDM2. Now, once this happens, remember, both of these, the, the, this uh, complex no longer exists. Now we have two separate products. We have MDM2 and we have P53 that's, um, that are present. So, and then this P53, phosphorylated P53, it can go and cause other proteins to do other things. Uh, it will go about, uh, one of the things that will do is, again, it's just going to auto-induce auto itself. Uh, it'll, it'll end up recruiting more of itself. So, uh, hopefully, this makes sense to you. Now that we've talked about, uh, in the previous slides, we talked about how everything keeps keep moving forward. Okay, so remember, look at that in the circle. Remember, we had uh, all this is interface. Oops, let's just erase this. So, if we said that if all this, if we're looking at uh, interphase, And then we said the very last part would be the mitotic phase, right? So therefore, then we talked about the different things that happen at different points. Then we talked about the G1 phase, we talked about the S phase, and then we talked about the G2 phase. And of course, this is our mitotic phase over here. Oops, all right. Um, okay, let me, oops, all right, so, um, there we go. So this part over here, how does that happen? There we go. So remember, this always occurs in a clockwise Fashion. So remember, we had a checkpoint over here, we had another checkpoint over here, and then we had a checkpoint over here. This is our third checkpoint over, over here. Why does this happen? Anyways, I think it's trying to get a date because I went up too high. All right, so if at these points, if everything is okay, then, you know, the cell, you know, it could just kind of keep on going. However, if at, at any one of these points, if something is wrong, so again, maybe the cell didn't grow. All right, so how do you get a stop over here at this checkpoint? So, uh, or for example, let's just imagine we're at this point, this part over here. Synthesis, DNA synthesis didn't, didn't take place. What's gonna cause the stop signal? Well, you know, you can use the example of this one over here, uh, where you know, we end up having a negative signal. Now we're not gonna be able to, to move forward. So if we can repair this, if we do repair it, then great things will continue to go forward. If we don't repair that signal, then the cell might end up killing itself. It might undergo apoptosis. All right, so hopefully that explains uh, both uh, go and, not go, but cell division and uh, stop signals. So if you have questions, make sure you email me or you, can, you guys can message me. And, uh, Study well. Thank you so much.